Um, how did I turn my Zoom meeting off, Barbara? Somehow I've turned it off or something. Can you come help me? I started it. I started it. And We're not on mute. Okay. Set you off of mute. Oh, all right. Thank you. Hold on. No, it's not. Yep, there you go. Okay. Thank you. So anything else I can do? Yeah, how do I get my bottoms, my bottom? Just in one house. Yeah. All right. Can you chat? Can you okay, great. Okay. okay, welcome. Welcome. Good evening. So the, the weather has changed dramatically here in Grand Rapids in the past couple of days. Um, it's gotten unbelievably hot, but blowing in from over in the Lansing area, from Skip maybe, is, uh, is something, something darker. So is there a chance that we'll lose power tonight partway through the session if we get a big storm? Sure. If my power goes out, I go blank, hey, we'll, we'll, catch, it, we'll catch it again. I want to tell you, I want to thank everybody for um, participating and for coming in and for making uh, donations on my website. I appreciate that very, very much. We do this twice a month. Our next meeting this month will be on 623 Tuesday, and we'll do the same kind of thing. This, um, this seminar is a little different in that I sent out uh, a bulk email to about 5,000 names that I have on constant contact. I hadn't done that till I got a couple of these under my belt and I was sort of used to them. Um, but the, the fun part is that more people will now be able to participate. I do record these sessions and I have a couple of them up on YouTube. So if you go to my YouTube channel, University Motors LTD, uh, you, you can find those, and if you want to sit through two hours of listening to me chatter, it's there, watch it. Um, um, there, I've done a couple for individual clubs that they have, um, they've recorded and they've kept it for their own, own members, so I can't, I can't show those. Anyway, tonight I wanted to start off because I want to start with something exciting, and I, and I put a link out on, on, Facebook, and I put a link out on my constant contact about my favorite MG movie, and it's MG's Forever by Amy, Amy Boyer, and she was a, a student, a, a senior at, at a college, I'm not sure which college, in Auckland, New Zealand, and she took this old eight millimeter film from the MG Car Club Auckland and combined it with modern stuff, a story, um, some of it's really, really spectacular. And that was the Vimeo link that I put on there. And I, I, I'm happy to, uh, you can go on Zoom chat. I'm happy to write down whatever favorite MG movie you have. There's other stuff to talk about, but MG movies are fun. Um, Dale Brown wrote me a note and said that his favorite was uh, uh, 1972 Sleuth with Michael Caine and Laurence Olivier and Michael Caine uh, pulls up to the mansion in an MGB. Then he also goes on to say that, that there's also a Morgan plus eight um, in the movie Speechless. So if you want to know where you can see mo uh, MGs in movies, of course, there's the IMDB, the Internet Movie Database. But there's a clone. And there's lots of spinoffs from the IMDB. And one of them is called the IMCDB. Dot com, something like that, the Internet Movie Car Database. So if you go in there and look up Matchless or Elvis, um, a Daimler, or in this case, MG, there are hundreds and hundreds of hits that people have recorded and sent in, um, all the way from, from mainline movies to X-rated movies. The, the, whole, the whole gambit is there, French, German, English, you name it, there are so many movies that include an MG. Maybe just a brief look, or maybe it's the it's the car of the of the main character. But 
Anyway, if you've got a comment about that, you can put that on, on group chat. Craig West from Peoria, Illinois, not really from there, but close enough, um, has asked me about torque. He said, please say a couple words about torque. What is torque? You know, and torque is, is the resistance to turn for a bolt. We know that there are torque settings, especially for the engine cylinder head nuts and other things in the car too, to make sure that they're tight enough. Old metal didn't stretch much. It just, it was brittle, it fractured. New metal stretches. And if you pick up the book fasteners or nuts, bolts, washers by, I don't know, Smokey Eunuch or something like that, one of those old time American authors that's uh, put this thing together, he'll tell you that you don't need to use lock washers. You don't need lock washers. You just get the torque correct. Well, that, that works on a modern car and on modern cars, you torque something up to maybe, I don't know, 60 foot pounds and then pull it another 30 degrees. I mean, there's a whole lot of science and it all has to do with the stretch of the bolt so that the bolt won't come undone. I prefer to use lock washers. I think lock washers make a lot of sense. I, I don't, and, and nylock nuts make a lot of sense in some places, but then I like to be original. But torque is measured in, in most commonly in pound feet, not foot pounds, everybody says foot pounds, but it's in pound feet. And then the, the smaller variation of our system is uh, inch, inch pounds. I'm gonna, I'm gonna see if I can find, I've got somebody here who's uh, got some noise in the background and I wanna mute all, but now the noise has gone away. So whoever was coming up with some noise, if you're not muted, uh, mute yourself, please. I can't find my mute, here we go. Here's mute all. There, I'm not going to mute myself, but if you've got something to say when we get a little farther along here, of course, you can un unmute yourself and we'll go for it. <clears throat> so torques are usually done on clean nuts and bolts. Uh, there are different kinds of lubrication you can put on studs, and that will reduce the torque setting because the whole point of a torque is to measure how much co um, compression there is by the resistance to turn. <laughs> And if the resistance to turn is, is um, mixed up with lubrication, then you're gonna need less resistance to turn to compress something, say for instance, the cylinder head gasket. So there's, there are torque settings for grades of bolts, grade two, five, eight, um, you can go on a chart. There's lots of charts available, and you can say, well, a grade five, a 20, you know, a 5 16 24 grade, uh, grade five bolt uh, should take a maximum torque of, I don't know, 22 pounds or 25 pounds or something. There are special bolts that are hardened that take higher, um, but you can also go into your workshop manual, and there's a lot of information in there. Generally speaking, when you're tightening up any nut or bolt on the car, you tighten it up and it just, there's no resistance to turn. You're tightening it and all of a sudden, all of a sudden the torque just takes off because it's all, all the way tight. And I, I mean, I've been doing this for a long time, but I, I, go, to, I go to wrist tightness or, or um, elbow tightness. I know that doesn't sound very exacting, but over a period of time you get used to it. If you have any questions at all, get out a torque wrench. Click torques are the easiest. You pull them, they click, they're just great. Click torque wrenches. So anyway, that's that's from Craig West. Let me uh, let me say uh, something here from Jim Pastor. You know, there's been no car shows, obviously, you know, all season long. And Jim Pastor has a, a car show in Altoona, Pennsylvania. Altoona, so it's centrally located. It's also home of the Boyer Candy Company, and you can go to the Boyer Candy Company and buy a, a box of mallow cups. I mean, a carton, it's a real deal. Um, anyway, they have a really nice car show. It, it usually attracts about 100 cars. This year, it'll probably be bigger because there haven't been any other car shows. It's the weekend before Labor Day. I can't tell you what, what the date is, but uh, real late August. And it's the uh, Central Central Pennsylvania British Car Fest. 
if you want to, if you're interested, if you live PA, Northern Maryland, uh, New York State, they have people come from. <laughs> Jim says, "Yeah, we got a guy coming from Indiana." Yeah, Indiana, Pennsylvania. Um, but they've had people drive all the way from Atlanta, so it's it's a real good show. So Jim just wanted me to say something about that. He also runs a a, a technical seminar in uh, concurrently with that, or a couple of days before that, and he still has a couple of spots. So I I come out and do that. Um, I come out and and do the do the technical seminar. We do it in his shop. It's always a lot of fun. About 20, 25 guys. I don't know what we're doing this year. I don't remember if we've decided. But it's it's hey, it's just it's just entertainment. It's fun. You know, you, you learn something. Before I get a little bit uh, farther along here, Reinout Vote and his wife Henneke, who used to be in the greater Chicago area after they moved here from the Netherlands, a real MG enthusiast, uh, have moved to Atlanta. And and uh, Reinout, I followed up on my offer to answer questions online. And he's trying to bleed the brakes on his 1600 MGA. They put new wheel cylinders in back, um, bled them all out, airs all out of the system, adjusted them up, adjust the mask and the adjuster of T-type and the MGA is real early bug eye sprites. Got a mask and adjuster adjusted all the way up, hit the pedal, it's almost on the floor, second bump, it's right up. What is going on? So you just have to go out and, and drive the car right now. Just go out and drive the car around the block, make the brakes smoke, bed them in, as what we used to call them. That's a, get them hot, get them shaken up, come back. You'll get a couple more clicks out of each mask and adjuster, and the brake pedal ought to be just great. So I think it's just that. It's not, it's not uh, a problem with uh, air in the system or anything. What he did do, what Reinout did do, it's a real good um, uh, technique, is to take a pair of ice grips and, sounds horrible, squeeze the, the rubber line in the back and then hit the pedal and this pedal's rock hard. So obviously the problem, this all this extra movement is at the rear of the car in the rear axle. So that's, that's how you can determine where the problem is in the car which he has, and it's the rear brakes. You just gotta go out and drive it, drive it, heat them up, take care of them. Let me get another one here. Um, this is from Fred Moore. Um, and I, you know, I, I, made a, I made a pitch in here about, about uh, get some friends to, together and pay my travel expenses. And I'm happy to come to your shop or your, you know, your locality and, and bring my tools and everything and have a couple days. I don't, I, do not want to change a clutch, don't want to, don't want to do brakes, but like simple electrics and, and getting stuff sorted out, um, it'd be lots of fun. So you can get in touch with me. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to do that. And I'm happy to come out to your club if your club wants to have an event. Um, so, but there's travel expenses and a, and a daily rate and stuff like that. But, you know, here I am and I'm, I'm, I've got one big project left in my shop. I got my MGA on the road. Oh my gosh, thank you. After two and a half years, I thought it was only off the road for a year. I went to renew my plates. Can't do that. We're in the state of Michigan. Secretary of State's closed down, but this governor, um, the governor has told the state, all the police departments that they cannot ticket you for having an expired registration even though mine's two and a half years expired. But finally, I got my MGA. I've got a 62 MGA 1600 Mark II Deluxe that I bought in, in spring of 1976. I've driven who knows how many. I looked at the clock today, it's 8,300 miles on it. And I thought, what, 283 or 308, who knows? Lots of miles on, on that car. But I just got done putting in pistons and a brake master cylinder and I reworked the seat belt, so those are nice front coil springs, and I had the wheels re-rimmed, oh boy, so and it loves to fly. I've got a camshaft in it from uh, David Anton, APT-FAST, Advanced Performance Technology. He makes really good cams. I bought this from Forrest. I turned my business over to Forrest Johnson. He's renamed it the Rusty Moose Garage. And uh, anyway, Forrest had this cam in his MG8, hated it, and I can see why, because around town, it sounds, feels like you can't tune your own car. But out on the road, you hit 60 miles an hour, and that thing just wants to fly. It's so much fun up at, at those high speeds. Well, let me take a look at the chats here and see what uh, 
what's going on here. Diamonds in the rough, two, ki two kids rebuilding a TC uh, to rally to get to crosswise the jewel thieves. Oh, lots of classic in, in um, classic English cars, diamonds in the rough. But again, you can go to that um, internet movie car database and find this stuff. Here's Bart from the Netherlands. It's 2:05 a.m. there. Well, it's probably later. I've been chatting for a while. Okay, he's got a um, he's got a 77 MGB with a, Lu a original Lucas uh, amplified ignition. Leave it or replace it. It must be that it's got the black box underneath the coil. The earlier si system um, had, <coughs> excuse me, had a electronic unit right with the distributor. Those have all failed. Those are all done. And that had a, a green, green. Are, are you on now, Bart? Did you unmute yourself? You can. Yes. <clears throat> I'm here. Hi, hi. Yeah. Okay. So your your ignition, you've got a, a black box underneath the coil, do you think? Yes, I have. Yes, okay, I that's have. fine. Yes. It's a great system. Just leave it. But oh, remember okay. <laughs> that all electronics fail. It's not well, a question of... I mean, it, you know, points go bad too, but they give you, they mm -hmm. usually give you some warning, you know, I mean, it, yeah, it's well, harder it. to start or you lose, you know, you, when you lose a degree of dwell, you lose a degree of timing and the car's harder to start, it won't go up hills and stuff, and you know something's wrong, but with electronic, you're dead in the water. So, yeah. depends on how far away from home you stray, but... Well... A, a good 1,000 kilometers, uh, oh, yeah, 700 miles or something. That's, that's too so, far to that's too far to uh, hitchhike home or have a car hauled well, home. So it. you can carry an extra distributor, just a complete point style cheap distributor in the car. If you carry it in the car, then your electronic ignition will never fail. Um, but if you don't carry okay. it, if they if you don't carry it, then that electronic ignition will wonder when when it should go. You know. So, <laughs> Yeah. So, anyways, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but I, I'd leave it okay. in the timing. Timing is critical. It doesn't matter where our cars are, whether they're in the Netherlands or France or Canada or North America. All of our cars, 19, 1945 through 1980, not the twin cams, are timed at 32 degrees before top dead center at full mechanical advance, vacuum disconnected. So that means when the car is running as fast as it can run, it, I mean, the advance is a, as advanced as it can get. It never strays beyond 32, and it gets to 32. But you can't have the vacuum hooked up because that'll, that'll screw up your settings. So a TC 1980 MGB, 32 degrees before time center at full mechanical advance. It's up around three 4,000 RPM. Make the car run. Okay. Run well. Okay. Whoops. Now Bobby Bobby Galvez has changed the name of the movie now. Now it's Diamonds on Wheels. But anyway, um, God. Jim Schulte. Uh, Jim Schulte's got a note here uh, with Charles Bronson where he's trying to dump a body over a cliff, and two guys pull up in an MGB, a chrome bumper B. Apparently the ignition was working, and try to pick up his wife. <laughs> so. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of movies with this stuff in it. Um, now, here we got a note from Eric, who says, I think you've got a max of 100 participants. I see it bounced between 99 and 100. Last month, it went up to 120. So I'll take that. I'll take that. I, 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 bought, the, I bought the, you know, the beer package and all that kind of But maybe I didn't pay a monthly. I don't know. You're right. I, it's sitting here at, at 100. So, so. I had uh, Try about 15 times to get in because it said you've reached the max at 100. Uh oh, oh, well, I, I gotta have my, I gotta have my, my uh, daughter take a look at this. Shoot, you know, I wanted to make sure everything was all set before I went out and sent that that email out to everybody. Well, everybody think, oh my God, it's so popular. I'll have to tune in next time. Larry Sears, Sears, can I post a question here? Absolutely. Randy Shuck, um, John, will answer after. Uh, the address and written questions. Tom Snook, is there a specific brand of three-point seat belts for the MGA that you recommend? Anything's okay, but you want a three-point. You don't want two-point. Gosh, um, 
Mike, Mike from Rockford and one of the guys, Dave Quinn, I think, were coming back from a GT. They were in Lansing, Michigan, something or other. An F-150 pulled out in front of them. They T-boned it, you know, crunched the MGA. Just, just total, total the MGA. Both of their heads went forward. Dave was driving. He hit the steering wheel. Mike's went into the dashboard, and they said, you know, Mike, you know, you all those knobs sticking out there. There's a possibility that that um, um, that there's some damage to your head, you know. So they they put him in a in a, one of those MRI tubes, and they said, "My God, that that saved your life. You had a tumor growing behind your nose, and if you hadn't had this, that tumor would have wrapped itself around, and we may not have been able to get it out." So the guy was saved by having a two point seat belt. That's that's a real exception. <laughs> Get a three point, um, and uh, I, I there's a bolt uh, that you can use on the earlier cars uh, where the fender attaches that you can hook behind your 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 uh, you get the top. It's nice to have it hook around something um, because if it's a fixed belt, then of course how are you going to change it between the top up and top down? But I don't have a I don't have a, a favor when I've got old Kangol belts. That I that I salvaged from an Austin America in 1980, and uh, that's I think the ones Moss sells are probably good. Good, but I like the hook style. You've got to have something that you can disconnect because you've got to get that long leg um, above or below the the uh, the, the top bows. Uh, Larry Sears, I know John only has two hours, but uh, he could discuss leaks. I could. I rebuilt my MGA, but I seem to have both engine and gearbox leaks. Of course, talk to anybody else here. Um, so anyway, we'll we'll talk we'll talk about leaks. Uh, let me go on just a little bit farther though, because that's that's a that's a uh, oily subject. Um, does anyone here's here's David Wren. Does anyone know where I can get an early B uh, MGB door handle pulls or door skins? And David's in New Zealand, where it's either very much later or very much earlier than it is here. So there's a guy in Arvada, Colorado, um, at Sports Car Craftsman. His name is Paul Dierschau. You don't have to know how to spell his last name. It's Paul. And he Sports Car Craftsman, C-R-A-F-T-S-M-E-N, in Denver, Colorado. And he's got a breaking yard, and he's got a couple hundred MGAs, excuse me, couple hundred MGs, and if he has the part, he will send it to you today or tomorrow. You won't screw around. It's, you don't call him three weeks later and say, dude, you know, like, where's my door handle? And he goes, oh, well, my, you know, my dog got sick. I, I couldn't find a box to send it. He'll, he, he'll send it immediately. Plus, he lived in Australia. Um, I know that's not your country, but uh, he lived in Australia for five years maybe so he's got a lot of connections down there so maybe you can find somebody um closer to you uh, in sydney or uh, you know perth i mean although perth's about as far from you as we are i think um anyway paul dearshaw sports car craftsman arvada colorado he's the greatest guy in the world for you use parts he really is I'm, i just can't say enough about him obviously and he doesn't pay me for making uh, these these things Let's see, um, Brad Thurlow says, I'm curious exactly which cam you got from APT. Um, I think it's the VP12 or 13. It's a real radical one. It's like a 290 cam. It's just too much. It's just too much for, for driving around town and stuff, you know, but I just drive it on the expressway. I just love going fast. So it's... Um, uh, contact me later on on email, and I'll I'll see if 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 I can find. So um, Tom Snook is yeah you know, just uh, you know um, for the MGA. Peter Koreski in Virginia uh, said you stated in one of your last sessions that the 77B is a engine is a closed system. Yes, ELC evaporative loss control and PCV positive crankcase ventilation. He says the previous owner installed an aluminum valve cover. He also installed a vent hose from the vapor canister to the valve cover with an 1164th vent hole in the cover. I have a Weber carb with a hose going 
from the side covers to the carb to let the engine breathe. I formerly used a breather on the side of the engine, um, but I was getting oil all over the engine. What's happening now is that when I take the B for exercise, there's a small amount of oil on the top of my valve cover. What's causing this? Because the engine isn't breathing well. We know when, when the engine runs and you've got all that compression sitting on top of the piston, um, it's blowing down the side of the piston. That's called blow by. It's either a little tiny bit on a fresh engine or really bad on an old, old engine. That's the job the compression rings do. And you've got to get that, that, those fumes out of the inside of the engine. Now, they used to have T types, MGA, early MGB, early midgets, and what they called an oil draft tube. You use the Bernoulli effect. And the oil draft tube went down the side of the engine, and, and it's a big around as your thumb. And, uh, you know, the engine had no problem at all venting. But then in 1964, California said, we've got to do something about the smog here in LA. So they put uh, PCV systems on it, um, positive crankcase ventilation systems. And that's where that big round mushroom Smith's PCV valve comes from, 1964 through 1968. And then in 1969, they, they got rid of the valve and plumbed the side cover directly into the carburetors. Now there's a draft that went through the oil filter through the oil filter cap and then through the engine and got drafted out into the carburetors and burned up. And that worked great um, until 1970 when they said, well, that's still not good enough. And then each year after that, it got more and more complicated with anti-run on valves and two charcoal canisters. But the problem you've got with your Weber is you can't get enough draft into the air cleaner. So take that Weber grid that's about that, that tall and that, that big around and bore a hole in it, about the size of a quarter, I mean a big hole. Go to Napa, find a fitting, maybe you should go to Napa and find the fitting first, um, that you can get in there with a nut on, on each side of it and put your half inch hose to that. So the half inch hose comes off the vapor separator, on the, the oil separator on the side of the engine and into your air cleaner on, on your Weber. And in so doing, you'll put quite a draft on the engine. There won't be too much of a draft because it's not manifold draft. It's just the draft going into the air cleaner. So that'll be okay. And then everything else ought to work okay. The reason you're getting oil out on top of the engine now is because the engine is pressurizing and that oil wants to go someplace and it's going back, back out the cap. Chances are. M might be that you need new rings too. I mean, I, there's lots and lots of possibilities, but that's probably it. Just make it breathe better. Why would you see a little bit of that on a brand new engine, John? <sighs> well, which, which one, Rich? The 1600. I, I get it coming through the rivets underneath the little, you know, the, the, the yeah. copyright or yeah. whatever you call it. So that, um, there's a lot of oil spattering up inside that valve cover. And if, you've, if you replace the plates on the valve cover, then there's a hole there and there's it's constantly a wash with oil on the underside. And so the oil will find its way out just, just from gravity, just splash and gravity, not from pressure. Um, so sometimes what people will do is get that all nice and clean on the inside of there and put a little plug of, of like, like the right stuff um, underneath there so that it won't, it won't ooze and goo out, out of that hole. So, so let me just, uh, let me go to the next one here. Um, Lou Bala says to everyone, I have a 64B and when I start it, when I start it cold, the starter will disengage and I have to wait before spinning it again. Um, and then I can try and repeat and repeat. So what I think Lou's telling us is that he starts the car up, he turns the key, and the starter motor goes ring, 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 and it just kicks out. It just kicks out. So he waits for the system to come to rest and turns the key again, ring, 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 and it kicks out again. The problem is not the starter motor, the problem is the choke. What happens with a Bendix? Uh, Bendix is designed to kick out when the engine starts to run faster than the starter motor. So one cylinder fires. Suddenly the engine speeds up, kicks the starter motor out, 
but won't stay running because it just, it, there isn't enough mixture control yet. So um, almost always the problem that the, the, I've had so many people call and say, oh, I think I need a new starter motor because it, it kicks out. No, your, your jet should drop, the jets in the bottom of your carburetor on your 64B should drop at least a quarter of an inch. When you pull the choke out of the dash, um, go underneath there and look, and they'll 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 move. They, they if you move them down half an inch, it'll start in Antarctica, you know. So um, it it has to do it has to do with the distance that you're dropping, the distance that you're dropping the jets. That's the problem, not the starter motor. I mean, these are all my opinions and armchair opinions at a thousand miles. Or, whoa, winds winds coming up here. Um, you know, these are all armchair opinions, but they're, they're, they're experienced. So here we've got from Vicki Smith with her 72 MGB, the idle light will not go out. That's the ignition warning light, the red light will not go out even when driving. So, so Vicki, are, are you there? Thank you, Beth. I'm not Vicki, but I'm her husband. Okay, all right, okay, so anyway, um, so the problem, the problem is that the alternator is not charging. The light is, is an indicator, it's, it's just a, it's a trouble light. It comes on when you turn the key on, so you know that it works. And then when you exceed 800 to 1000 RPM, it should go out and, and then with an alternator, it just offhand, it never comes back on again. If it pulses, if it, if it glows very, very faintly, if it's on bright, it's an indicator that there's something wrong with the charging system. That might be the alternator itself, probably is, but there's a lot of stuff that, can, that I'm, gonna, I'm gonna mute. There's, a, there's a, some static here in the background. I'm gonna mute everybody again. Um, there's um, an erratic connection can cause the, the Lucas alternator to fail. So rather than just go out and buy another alternator or have yours fixed and put it back on and suddenly end up with the same problem, um, my suggestion is to take care of all the electrical connections first. So you take the clamps off the battery, you take the, the, the ground strap off the battery box, make sure those connections are good. Um, you go to the bottom of the starter motor and there's a cable as big around as your finger. It's a main battery cable, there's a nut, Take him off, there's a bunch of brown wires on ring terminals. Take those all off, tighten up the nut underneath, put them all back on, tighten those up. Take the plug off the back of the alternator. There's a, a barb on each one of the copper contacts in there. Um, pop the barb and you can slide the, slide the uh, contact out. Pinch them with a pair of pliers, put it all back together, um, start the car up. Light's still on or not, maybe it's gone off. Maybe you've solved it. Maybe not. If you haven't, now you can go ahead and have your alternator repaired. Every 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 city has an alternator repair shop. Those guys cut their teeth on Lucas stuff, and you get. A, I think personally, my gut is that you get a better job um, getting one rebuilt locally by somebody that's been in the trade, rather than buying one out, out of a box from Napa or anybody. You can buy new ones from Moss, no problem. They're aftermarket aftermarket ones you can buy put on Delco Remy's or the the hot setup for a while was the um, oh what was that General Motors car that all, all the school teachers bought made in t Tennessee um, they had a 100 amp alternator and all you do is take it apart and rotate the front cover 90 degree or 120 degrees you ended up with an alternator fit an MGB perfectly charge it 100 amps of course that'll burn out your wiring if <laughs> If, if it wants to put out 100 amps, but there's a lot of other options. I, I'm always a fan of staying as original as you can on as much stuff as you can. So anyway, take care of the electrical connections and then go for the problem with, uh, um, with the alternator. Thank you, John. And Bill Barge, who's been in on every one of these, you're welcome. Bill Barge, I've seen you seen Bill on here and said he had to try a couple of times because it said there's a max of a hundred. Damn it, I'll, I'll have to I'll have to sort that out. And here, Randy Shuck says AccuSpark, A C C U. Uh, Spark makes a very nice electronic distributor. 
uh, around a hundred bucks on eBay. So it'll work, but you don't know that the uh, advanced curve is correct. That's, that's the problem. That's the problem there. Uh oh, and Bart from the Netherlands says he had to sign off because it was uh, 120 AM there. So, um, oh, and then we got Mark Sherman who's who back to movies, MG movies, who says two for the road. That was, that was uh, two for the road. Was that a movie? What was the, the one that was on television? The, 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 the investigators, husband and wife. So, so anyway, from, from uh, Code A, we have a 1500 midget shell and a 1275 midget. The question isn't posed, but it's apparent. Can you put a 1275 drivetrain into a 1500 midget? Simple answer is yes. The difficult answer is how do you hook up the gearbox and how do you hook up the engine? But if you can get past those two things, it's straightforward. You know, the, the um, you know, carburetors and exhaust uh, are on opposite sides. So there's some hocus pocus that you have to do, but um, you can stretch everything over and make it work. I've seen 1275 engines and gearboxes fitted to 1500s. Haven't seen it the other way around. The 1500 midget engine is a Spitfire engine, and it's really, really heavy. Um, it's got main bearings and rod bearings that are like really, really, really narrow. So they'll spin up really fast. And the, the uh, Spitfire engine doesn't have cam bearings. You just run the, run the cam right in the cast iron block. Uh, I would tell you that I don't think the engine is as is built with the quality that that a, a BMC engine is, and it's heavier. But that was the that was the trade-off that they made in '79 to, uh, excuse me, '75, uh, when they were you know the British Leyland combined a lot a lot of their processes and got rid of that A engine for the for, for the for the midget. So it is possible, but boy, you want to go online and I mean everything's been done. You don't have to reinvent anything. Um, somebody's already done this, and um, you, I'm yeah, sure yes. on uh, uh, so, uh, experience. Yeah, go ahead. So um, I'm currently sitting in one of the 1275 cars, but um, so here is the 1500 car, the Harvest Gold car. Yeah. The question was, um, I'm sorry, I'm still 14, so I'm still pretty ignorant, but um, can you fit a 45D distributor into a 25D distributor? Absolutely. And, Okay, thank you. All, all the distributors are all the distributors are exchangeable, from mm -hmm. starting from 1954 to 1980. The only mm -hmm. thing that changes is whether they're points or electronic, and their advanced curve. Mm -hmm. There's a couple different standard bodies. The, the, okay. the MGA is yeah. used as sort of an old-fashioned thing with lead weights, and then the MGBs went to steel weights, and the midgets used those too. Um, and then in, in 1975, they changed the to a, uh, the body changed from a 25D to a 45D. It's just a description of the body, We're not the advanced yeah. curve, not nothing. And, and you can get the 45D in electronic or in points. That was the, the 41427 was the Euro spec MGB uh, uh, distributor that oh, Moss, yeah. everybody sold them for years as a replacement for the electronic one, but they're all back and forth. But, but to make the car run best, you've got to get the, the distributor that makes your car run the best. Get, get in touch with me. I'll, I'll talk to you. We'll, we can take some time. Thank get you. you. Get you sorted okay. out there. All right, so here we've got John Mueller to everybody in the gay divorcee where Fred Astaire chases Ginger Roberts. She's driving an Auburn, and he's driving a J2. So, <laughs> so chance, chances are, um, so we're we're gonna I'm gonna have a hard time uh, uh, getting through some of these. Uh, we got a lot of notes here on on the side tonight. Hang on just a second. Where where am I? Oh my gosh, I lost my position here. Um, <clears throat> so let's see, just just a second. Here we go. Um, <clears throat> Um, I'm having a, I'm having, oh, this is good from Joe. Um, and he says he's having a TD, uh, TD rebuilt 
and it's going on a test stand, I guess tomorrow, sometime soon. So that's that's cool. Um, and let's see here, we, uh, let me just see what's next. Adding a front sway bar to a TF, Chuck Linick. Chuck, how you doing? Um, that's the single most important thing that you can do to any of our cars for handling is to put on the sway bar. Absolutely, it goes on pretty easily. It hangs down, it isn't up, uh, up above the frame like it is on a B or like it should be on an A, but that's where they get mounted on, on T-types and they work just fine on the bottom of the dumb iron, excuse me, on the bottom of the dumb irons. And it, it just keeps that car from pitching pitching and rolling in corners. I mean, it is just, it's heaven. It's just unbelievable how much improvement you get from so little work. Not that it's a little bit of work, because you've got to spring, change the spring pans and the front A arms and then drill the, drill the dumb irons to accept it. But, you know, it's, it's, it's straightforward, but it is most certainly a worthy addition. I got some more stuff that came in on, on the, um, uh, Ted Smith writes from from England that he's got a uh, he's got his dad's car that he, his dad all hotted up and put a Darrington head on it and those things look neat those cross flow heads but if you want to like change the the timing or change the oil filter I don't know how you do it it's just too much stuff is jammed over there on the right hand side and in England you got the steering jammed over there too so oh my gosh but he had a question about cooling fans. And he's got one that that uh, is hand operated, and that's not a good idea. That you should either have a fan on the front of the engine if it'll take it, or have some sort of thermostatic control so the fan comes on by itself, so you don't have to operate it all the time. I told you earlier I, I've been driving my MGA, and um, the the turn signal canister doesn't work great. You have to hold it, you know. And I'm thinking, boy, modern. Modern cars are so intuitive. They even know you're going to turn left. They probably turn the turn signals on for you by, by themselves. And the older you get, the more complicated it gets. Um, if you go back to the pre-war cars and, and, and you had a, a switch on the dash because you had to keep watching your ammeter so you didn't undercharge or overcharge your battery. Um, but the, um, the thermostat control on a, on a, on a radiator that's that's pretty important that, that that comes on by itself here i've got another guy that wonders when i'm going to uh come to the uk to tune up their cars i went a couple years ago so here's larry smith from richmond virginia capital of the south i purchased an overdrive transmission but have not yet installed it in the car to test the solenoid i removed it from the transmission took off the top and when I energize the solenoid, the, the plunger retracts nicely um, within the coil. But if I put the top back on the solenoid and do the same, the plunger doesn't move. Well, it does. It, it, it has to. Um, if, if it was working before and you assemble it up. But, the, you know, the, on an overdrive solenoid, it moves so little. It only, move, it only moves if the, the most an eighth of an inch. Earlier MGPs, with a with a um, uh, solenoid on the side, great big clacky thing and a big lever that moves. But these are all internal, and it's just pushing a a three sixteenths ball up against a seat that the oil pressure pushes away from the seat when the when the solenoid isn't operating. So it's it's um, um, if if you can get the plunger if you can get the plunger to move, that thing's got to be working. It's got to be. So that's just my my comment to to Larry. Um, and then I got a note from Jim Burton from New Hampshire, who said, I'd love to attend the session tonight, but I can't. Will any of these be recorded? And I, as I already said, yes, they're, uh, they're, up on, uh, they're up on YouTube, so you can find them. So anyway, do you know the specs for a compression leak down on an x bag? You know, I've never done leak downs, so why not? Because you check the compression, and if the compression's okay, generally speaking, the rings are okay. If the compression's bad, you got to take the head off it anyway. I'm not sure why you do a leak down test. Maybe someone can instruct me. But if you've got bad compression, 
you got to take the head off anyway. So if you got bad compression, you take the head off, turn the head upside down, put fluid in the in the in the uh, chambers. If one of the exhaust valves leaks, it's instantly obvious. And then the other thing you do is move all the pistons to halfway up their stroke while the cylinder head is off and put in a certain amount of fluid in the top. I shouldn't tell you to use gasoline because it's such a dangerous solvent, but you've got to use something that looks and smells a lot like gasoline. It's really easy. Cleans out the, cleans out the oil when it gets down in the sump. And then you pour the same amount into each cylinder and come back in half an hour. And if one of them's gone empty and the other ones are still full, duh, you know, something's wrong with the rings there. But I don't know, you know, actually using, should you get a 90% leak down? Should you get a 98% leak down? Should you get a 62% leak down? I don't know. I don't know. Although my guess is it's an engine. I mean, it would be the same as, as anything else. The T-type original pistons have got three compression rings. So the leak down ought to be pretty, leak down ought to be pretty small. Replacement pistons often have two compression rings, but Anyway, uh, from uh, Scarlet, D. Scarlet, John, if time allows later, I'd like to know more about valve cover venting. My 18V engine has an aftermarket alloy, alloy cover with a chrome cap, which is vented. Is that enough? Well, there's lots more questions. You know, there, after 1973, there's an anti run on valve. The government doesn't want the car to, to spew unburned hydrocarbons, unburned gasoline. So in 75, they no longer trusted you and instead trusted the manufacturer and put an automatic choke on the car, except for the 75 midgets. Those still had a hand choke. Federal spec, not California spec. By 76, all automatic chokes. They didn't trust you to run the choke. Um, we all know that a hand choke works as well or most, most often better than an automatic choke. The same thing when you turn the car off, if it's dieseling, ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum, ba -bum, and the engine's rocking back and forth and so forth, you're spewing unburned hydrocarbons out the tailpipe. Government doesn't want that either. So in 1973, they, in, they um, forced the manufacturer to install a system that would stop the engine positively. And that's the anti-run-on valve. So if you want that to work and you don't have a Weber, if you've got um, SU carburetors on there that you can hook up to the float bowls and you want it to work, then you have to vent your valve cover over to the charcoal canister. So you tap the back of the valve cover and you put in a, a quarter inch pipe nipple. And then on the front of the pipe nipple, you put something up there that you can reduce the, the um, diameter from, I mean, it's eight, eighth inch on, on the inside, all of that. Um, you wanna reduce it down to, it's a tiny number, 5 or something. It's a tiny, tiny little hole that, that's in there. And so that will suck air out of the charcoal canister, into the engine, out of the engine, and into the carburetors. So I can explain some more that you're gonna call me tomorrow. I'm happy to talk more about it, but that's only if you've got SUs and you want the anti-run-on system to work. Otherwise, it doesn't make any difference. So Bobby's back up here. The Alves, I bled the brakes on my 79B and I didn't know about disconnecting the brake pressure switch. It's not a pressure switch, it's a shuttle switch, but we'll call it the same thing. Since then, the brake light not the brake light, but the brake warning light has been on constantly. That's the one on the dash. And I read that um, there's a mechanism with a small piston that activates that switch. Yes, so on, on 75 through 80 MGBs, on the bottom of the brake master cylinder, there's a little plastic switch. And that records the position of a shuttle valve. And if you, if you press on the brake pedal and you've got no rear brakes, the front brake system pressurizes, pushes the shuttle valve to the back of the cylinder, not the main cylinder, this is just a little, a little extra cil uh, cylinder inside the brake master cylinder, and that trips the switch in case you're not smart enough to know that if your foot hits the floor, your brakes are bad. So to reset that, you unscrew the switch off the bottom, takes a 9 16 uh, open end wrench, thin one, 
Um, if you unscrew it all the way, sometimes it's just a bugger to get it back in because you're working upside down. It's a, it's a steel cylinder. It's a plastic switch. You can get it, you can get it um, uh, cross-threaded so easily. So maybe you shouldn't take it all the way out. Just get it most of the way out. How do you know where, where that is? Anyway, either get it out or most of the way out. Get, go back inside the car, jump on the brake pedal a couple of times. That'll move that shuttle valve. Get it cent centrally located, put the switch in, it's all taken care of. So that's what you need to do. Take the switch loose so that the shuttle valve can move and then uh, jump on the brakes, stabilize the system, push the switch back, back up into place. But, but just be cautious because it is plastic and it's easy, so easy to cross thread it. Okay, so Jim Schulte writes and says, I've got a T35 Borg Warner tranny in my magnet. Lately, it's refusing to shift into second. I'm so stupid. Is a T35 an automatic or a stick? When it finally does, after 10 to 15 minutes of slow driving, it jumps into second and easily into third at 45. I checked the fluid level and it was down slightly. So what's what's a, a T, T35? Is that, uh, is that big heavy transmission that they use on the Bs and the MGCs? Is Jim, is Jim still here? Yeah, Jim. We're going to try to unmute Jim. There we go. Okay, Jim. Yes. That's an automatic. Yeah, it's out of a, yeah, it's an automatic. And it's out of an Austin Marina, a 74 yeah. Austin Marina. Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, I this know. was uh, Ron Cobb's magnet. I bought it from Ron Cobb. Okay. Uh, he was from uh, Florida. Okay, sounds like a real nice, you know, it's, it certainly works better than the original Magnet Manumatic. Yes. Which was one of the big, big recalls that BMC had. Um, right. Uh, I don't know. I don't think about automatics. So okay. I, I just, sorry, I don't know. Maybe you got to take it out, take it to transmission shop. Don't, don't know. Paul Deershaw, here comes his name again was really close, but I'm not sure that he's got there yet, for putting a more modern automatic. I don't know what kind. I don't know much, bizarre as it seems. I'm not a car guy, so I don't know much about cars. Um, I, know, I know a fair share about MGs, but I don't know what car still has an inline automatic. Um, maybe Miatas or something. I, I don't even know. Um, but anyway, he was, he was hoping to get very close to getting an automatic fit into an MGB, which I know would help a lot of people in their um, domestic lives, because then other people in the household would be able to drive the car. So, but I, 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 I don't know about that. I just don't. Wish I did. So let me come down here a little farther. Um, uh, Kode uh, has got another one here. There was a video uh, from Spridget Mania about the correct rivets. I'm not sure which rivets we're talking. I was talking to uh, uh, about the valve cover. Um, so I'm not sure. Jim Perel. Jim Perel, do you think that 16 eighth inch holes in the top of the oil cap is sufficient to breathe properly if it's the only source of intake air on the X bag? Yes. Yes. So the XPAG has got an oil draft tube as big around as your thumb. And if you read the workshop manual, it says that at idle, air comes up the oil draft tube, goes through the engine, gets sucked out into the air cleaner, and, and, uh, and that's how it vents. But it isn't necessary, and it wasn't designed um, to suck air in necessarily. Uh, Triumphs, for instance, TR6s, uh, don't have any air in entryway. They only have an air exit. Um, seems to me to make more sense to have some fresh air cycle through the engine. I mean, wouldn't that help out a whole lot? Um, but I'm sure that, 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 that's, that that's fine in your oil filler cap. That, that would be fine. Um, but the top of the oil cap shouldn't breathe, that's sealed. That's sealed, it breathes through the, through the air cleaner. 
it breathes through through the air cleaner in there, Jim. So, so you know, I, I, Jim's been talking to me about a problem he's been having with a, a, a beautiful, beautiful car, all rebuilt, brand new engine, everything just leaks oil everywhere, <laughs> everywhere. Oh, I have to get back to to that. I'll try. Um, Here's just a, a note from somebody who says, hey, people, mute, uh, mute when you come on. Okay, so um, here we've got from Larry Sears. In my A, I've gone over the carbs for hours, but the rear two plugs foul with carbon and appear wet. The front two carb uh, plugs look dry and clean. Flow level's fine. There doesn't seem to be leakage around the jet bearings. And I also see a lot of gray smoke when I release the accelerator. Okay, so let's talk about let's talk about oil, um, oil and 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 mixture and those kinds of things. So if you have uh, if you have an oil consumption problem, it's either the oil is either coming up the rings. Doesn't matter how good the compression is, you get, your con compression can be perfect, and you got no oil rings. You're going to burn all kinds of oil. So. Com Compression rings and compression have nothing to do with oil, oil consumption. Well, it does. Once the, once the compression rings get bad, you usually use a lot more oil. But um, So the oil can come up the rings or the oil can come down the valve guides between the, between the valve guide and the valve stem. You've got the, you've got the valves working inside there. And for the longest time, we thought those phosphor bronze mm -hmm. valve guides were critical to a, a good running engine because we'd lost the lead in 1975 and everybody drifted away from the old cast iron um, valve guides. Mistake, as it turns out. The phosphor bronze guides squeeze, they grab the valves, they gall the valves. So instead of having a half inch clearance between the valve guide and, and the valve stem, instead of having half a thousandths, you have to increase it to two thousandths so the valve guide won't grab the valve itself. So now you get to fit umbrella oil seals. So it gets a lot more complicated. Use cast iron guides. In the future, when you're going to have your cylinder head redone, use cast iron guides. They're just fine. There's no problem at all. It was a, a mistake. It was made early on or a, a misinterpretation of data, something or other. Use cast iron guides and use that half inch clearance and it'll be just fine. But you can use umbrella oil seals. Now in an MGA and an MGB, the FELPRO, F-E-L-P-R-O, part number is 70373. One of those numbers I happen to remember, 70373. Forget it. I call me tomorrow. I'll tell you, and that you install those on the inlet valves. You don't need them on the exhaust valves because there's always pressure blowing the blowing stuff up out of there. But if you take your foot off the gas and then put your foot back down, and you get a big burst of of smoke out the tailpipe, that's because as you let the let the, the throttle off, the intake manifold vacuum dramatically increases sucks oil down the oil guide, it pools and puddles, and then you hit the throttle and oh my gosh, it's just a, a huge cloud of smoke. Hardly ever does that happen. Yeah, the engine so, was rebuilt. What's that? The engine was just rebuilt, but. Okay, all right, so, so why are the rear two plugs wet? It's, um, it, it could be that, that the oil rings didn't seep. Could be. But what's the chance of those two right next to each other? Anything's possible. So that's certainly a possibility. But I put m more on the carburetor. It's real easy to have that brass shaft underneath the carburetor to stick. And I mean, that thread on the, on the, on the bottom of the carburetor um, for, to adjust the nut, that's a British standard brass thread, 26 threads per inch. So you've got approximately 25, 40, excuse me, approximately 40 full turns to move an inch. And if you back that off into flats, six flats per turn, that's six or seven thousandths of an inch per flat. Isn't much, isn't much. 
And if your jet happens to be sticking down because, because why? I don't know, because there's a mechanical linkage that the top jet bearing isn't in line with the bottom and the jet sticking, something, something. Um, and that jet is stuck down just the tiniest amount, tiniest amount, it'll run so rich. It'll run so rich. So just pull the choke out, push it back in and reach underneath the carburetors, that's easy on an A, and push up on the jet. And neither jet, neither jet should move one iota. None. Yeah. So that's that's I mean that's that's a that's a, a possibility. Is there a is there a possibility that there's a mismatch in the needles or that one of the needles is is pulled up and somebody put the needle in into the air piston wrong and it's sitting you know an eighth of an inch too high and, and it's just running too rich all the time. There's all these possibilities, but um, and uh, one, three, four, two are next to each other on on the distributor cap too. So is there you know is it is there a bad running problem? Um, the spark plug should be after it, take it out for a, a five ten mile run, hard run. Take the plugs out. They should they should look the the color of your class A's from the army, nice khaki color. And just tan, just tan. If they're bone white, it's way too lean. If they're black, it's way too rich. If they're black and wet, it's really rich. If it's black and wet and it's oily, how can you tell if it's oily? You can't. Um, then, then there's a problem with the oil rings. You can wipe your finger on the inside of the tailpipe in the back. You know, is that just sooty or is that sooty and oily? So these are all different different things that you can do. Call me tomorrow. We can talk about it and, and see if we, it's so frustrating when the engine's just been built, you're all excited to go, you know? And sometimes rings don't seat for 500 to 1,000 miles. It's just the way it is. And we we found right at the end of the time that I had the shop um, that a lot of the rings that were supplied with the pistons were not satisfactory. Oh boy, you know, not your fault, not the engine builder's fault, but you know, a nice, a nice compression ring, you take it and you should be able to just snap it they're so hard they're so brittle um but we had some where you could bend the rings bend them it's just like mm -hmm. oh my gosh so anyway those are those are all all possibilities so it might be ignition but oh boy that's pretty weird it might be the it might be the rear carburetor it might be their oil rings but why next to each other so i understand your your confusion so and I'm not sure about the smoke when you release the throttle. You release it and then hit it again. I get the smoke on that. I, I understand that. But anyway, so, um, all right. So let me go to the next one. I'm, I'm going to go to another printed one here. I got a couple more. Um, uh, Ray Costa uh, is from Iowa. Where's Ray from? And, and we did his engine a couple years ago. Um, and, uh, and now he thinks it's running too hot. Uh, and the question is how hot should the engine run? And that should be 88, 90 C Celsius or 100, 190 degrees Fahrenheit. That's a wonderful temperature for the engine to run. Um, how can you tell how hot it's running on a T-type, you know, on a, on a TC or a TD? You got it, you got your fitting that goes in the radiator you can tell how hot the radiator is. The radiator is always cooler than the engine, um, but it doesn't really the engine temp. If you get a, a, a gun, you know, an infrared gun, and shoot the engine here and there in every place, you can find a hot spot instantly if there's a problem with, with the cooling. But Ray was talking, there's some little tiny air bleed holes on the inside of a T-type engine that can cause air bubbles to, to be created. And, and uh, then you don't get full, full circulation, but Ray's got a couple years on the engine. Chances are those, those aren't making a, a big difference. But like everybody else, Ray, you can call me tomorrow too. So here's Mike Wester, who's uh, down, in, uh, down by uh, um, Columbus, Ohio. And he's putting uh, an MGB five main engine into uh, his MGA, 
and he wants to know if he can use like a TD or Sprite dynamo with a tachometer fitting on the back to drive his tack. Yes, most certainly you can. Will it be accurate? Most certainly not. Um, um, because the, the diameter of the pulleys changes up front. So it certainly is, is a realistic way to run the tack on your um, MGA. But what I would do instead, go on eBay, call Paul Deershaw, uh, and get a, um, a 65 through 67 MGB or midget electronic tack and have that wired into place. Now, it doesn't say Jaeger on it. It says Smiths, but you know, that's the only word that changes. And it just depends on how, how originally you want your dash to be. Gauge looks exactly the same. So that is an option, is to put an electric, an electric gauge in there. But will the T-type one work? Absolutely. You're gonna have to figure out what the error is. I don't know even how to start. I mean, it's either, it's either your, your, your measuring stick and, and, uh, and your calculator, or you just, you just see what the tag says when it's coming out and figure out what sort of induction or reduction device you have to have installed into the Speedo cable to speed it up or slow it down. That's done by Stuart Warner. They have gauges that go all, or uh, the little devices that'll go all the way from like 0.1% up to 1,000%. They'll do, they've got 16 little tiny gears inside there. And you can get any combination you want. If, if, you, if, you're, if your tack is running at 1,300 and it's supposed to be running at 1,500, they can give you 15 over 13 uh, as, a, as a ratio and your tack will read correctly. So, and also call Peter. Call Peter at uh, um, Nice Instruments in Mamaroneck, New, New York. Peter does a really good job with, with all that stuff. And I think that, that he'll have some answers for you too. So maybe he can put electronic guts inside yours. I don't know. So here I got, I got Bobby, I got your, your note. I did print it out, but I see that you, you put it in, in here. So, okay, so here we go from Harry's iPhone from Gibson. I have a 73B, a previous owner, cut the wires to the alternator just a few inches from the alternator. DPOs, that's what they're called on MG Experience, right? Um, how do I fix that? Well, you fix it with solder. You can make the wires as long as you want, no problem. You can get spade terminals. You can make individual spade connections on the back of your 73B, um, and, but you've got to solder the wires together. Solder them, not twist ties solder because those Lucas alternators do not like high resistance or erratic connections. A pop. We already had one comment in here earlier uh, from the guy who's using his wife's account um, and, and uh, the, with their ignition light glowing. So there's no point in wrecking your alternator if it's not wrecked yet. Um, so just extend the wires and, and um, uh, from the outside of the alternator to the inside are three spades and most of them go narrow, wide, wide. The later cars go narrow, extra wide, narrow. In both cases, the outermost lug on the alternator is, th is the brown with yellow wire, which goes up to the ignition warning light. That's the indicator lead. The center in all of these is your charging wire. That's gotta be a big, heavy, heavy brown wire, so it'll carry the current. The spade on the inside, if it's used inside the alternator, and you just don't know until you take it apart, but let's just assume it is, is, is yet another wire which goes down to the starter solenoid. It's not charging, it's a sensing lead so that the alternator charges at the correct voltage, uh, 14, point, 14 volts. Um, during during operation, so uh, just solder those wires on. That's that's what's so important. So now we have John Leone um, with a 54 TF. I have excessive smoke from the exhaust and found my chamber piston needle was set too high. 
Okay, I hazarded upon that. He said he lowered it and, uh, and it resolved the problem. However, when I connected the front spring lever, it starts to smoke again. Maybe the jet isn't centered. Maybe, maybe, maybe there's something go, going on here. Um, but because getting the jet centered in the earlier carburetors, that's all the carburetors, 1971 and earlier with, excuse me, 68 and earlier with fixed needles, getting the, getting the needle right in the center of the jet, that is so critical. The top of the, the jet is 90 thousandths. The top of the needle is 89 and a half thousandths. So you haven't got much wiggle room, literally. And you have to make sure and, and uh, to adjust that on a T-type or on an MGA, you need a half inch BSF wrench to loosen up the gland nut. Uh, there's a procedure for it in the workshop manual. If you've got a question, you can call me. And, and um, you've, got to, you've got to get that jet centered in there. So when you pick the piston up and let go, it, it, it drops. And, uh, and so that the, the lever works nice and freely which is either through exercise and, and or lubrication and or new gland washers, uh, which you can get from Joe Curto. So, all right, from Greg, uh, he's got a 72B with 37,000 miles. It's hard to believe, that isn't very many. Last on the road in 78, pulled the engine to replace all the gaskets and steels and then start, installed hardened valve seats. Should I replace the core plugs? Yes, that's the core plugs on the side of the engine. There are four of those. There are one in, one in uh, oh my gosh, brain fade. They're not one in three eighths, that's T-type, one in five eighths. So you've got two different types of core plugs. One are called dish. If you turn them upside down, they look like a dish. And the other one are cup that have ridges on the side. We're using the dish style. So you pull all those. The rear one, of course, is a bugger because it's behind the, the uh, rear engine bearing plate. So you pull those out, drill a hole in them, like a well, 3 16 hole, take a prick punch, the hammer, bam, 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 twist the thing out, pop it out, and then use a die grinder with a brush on it, your drill with a brush on it, and clean out the, clean out the relief really, really well. Put the new, um, freeze plug in there, get something that's hmm, half, at least half the diameter of the freeze plug. Your socket extension works well. Mr. Stanley doesn't want you to use your socket extension and a hammer to flatten out freeze plugs, but I can assure you it works great. And, and just flatten out the plugs, flatten out the plugs. Um, if you hit them too hard, they, they, they dimple, and then they, they, the outer circumference ends up contracting again. So you don't want to go past, past horizontal. You just want to bring them down. And then, this is the trick, mix up JB Weld. I sound like Paul Harvey here. Mix up JB Weld and smear it on the outside of the, of the freeze plug against the block. I just put up a YouTube, YouTube video about that from Texas in October. So smear it around there. It's easier if the engine's on its side because that this is real, real runny plastic it'll move, um, but, but let that set up. You paint it afterwards, you don't even see it, don't even see it, and that will keep the plug from popping out. Because let me tell you, this is so horrible. You're going down the road and all of a sudden, pop, you get a one and five eighths hole in the side of your engine and all the coolant runs out. I mean, you can't, no matter how many times you walk to the nearest stream, you can't fill it up. You can't put a rag in there and hope it's gonna, it just, you're off the road. So don't let that happen. Use JB Weld after the freeze plug is, has been installed. So, T-types, you can get um, brass, brass plugs that, that don't rust. Here we go, here Bobby Galvez is, is put back in here and it's the uh, McMillan and wife. We had the TD with Rock, Rock Hudson and Susan St. James. That was on t TV, so. So Gary, Gary's asking me, how do we know if your kingpins are bad? MGA or MGC. Um, so jack the front of the car up, grab the wheel at <laughs> grab the wheel at 12 o'clock and six o'clock and move the wheel, you know, in and out. 
move, move it back and forth. It wiggles. What's wiggling? Wire wheel against the hub, um, hub against the stub axle, the stub axle against the kingpin. Sometimes it's hard to tell, so you get down there and you get a bright light, have somebody else wiggle it and look at it. And on an MGB, you can see the bottom of the kingpin moves back and forth. It just does, they all do. Um, it, it's, it's not, it, they should have had about eight grease fittings in there. They started off with two. Um, the funny got to three, but it, it could use it could use a bunch more, and and then and then of course constant maintenance. Um, but in the end, what difference does it make? It can get pretty loose up there. You can move, excuse me, you can move an eighth of an inch, and not not cause too much of a problem. I mean that that re I mean practically. You want your car to handle perfectly and everything. Yeah, you got to buy kingpins. You can you can buy the kingpin kit. You got to have the reamer. You can buy the reamer. It's a hundred seventy five bucks. Just buy the rebuilt kingpins from somebody that offers them. I think MG's Unlimited in in uh, Milwaukee offers them. I, Moss might offer them. They're all set to go. All set up. Exchange usually, um, unless you're a machinist, and then and then you wouldn't be asking the question anyway. So, um, John. Yes. Would this have anything to do with hard steering? No. Oh. No. So, um, so steering. If your steering is hard, in other words, it's hard to turn the wheel. Hard to turn the wheel. Or when you're at speed, and at speed I mean 45 miles an hour, and turn the wheel and let go of the wheel, it should snap right back straight. That's what you know. You got three factors up front. You've got caster, camber, and toe in. I know it's hard to see, but caster is this, right. you know, camber is this, and toe in is this. So there's enough uh, caster in the kingpins to pull the wheels straight. Not as much as on a TC, but you don't steer a TC, you just aim it. So you, you sort of get it straight down, down the road and then tug at it when it starts to fall out of the lane. But uh, the MGB should be absolutely limber i mean you should be able to take your little finger and just just steer it should be so easy so what could be the problem left kingpin is frozen right kingpin is frozen uh rack and pinion is is um, um jammed up i mean it, all those take take um maintenance and, and grease so if you unscrew the tie rod from the tie rod end you can see if the if the kingpins are loose or not. You know, one of them flops around and the other one's hard to move. Hey, we used to have them come in. You know, I I mean I I worked on MGs when they were primary primary transportation. And people would come in. Oh my gosh, you couldn't believe it. These women would come in and you'd I'd say, how are you even steering this? And they'd say with great difficulty. You know, e -e -e. oh my gosh, it takes so much effort to turn the wheel. And we take a torch and just liquefy the grease on the inside of the kingpin. Just heat it up and keep pumping grease into it. And it get all nice and free and the, and the steering would go free again. I had one guy who um, we brought his MGB GT into the shop. And I said, gee, I called him. I said, Tim, this thing, this thing steers really hard. Is that, you didn't bring it in for that. But I mean, it's really hard. He goes, yeah, well, that, that didn't happen until I brought it down to your shop. And I said, well, where'd you hook the chain when you pulled it? He goes, we're on that tube in the front. So he hooked it on the rack and pinion and bent, you know, bent the rack and pinion. So that uh, the rack and pinion hardly ever bends by itself, but um, the rack and pinion requires lubrication. And then on the earlier cars, um, like a real early B, then you've also got column bushings and those, those can get stiff or a combination of, of all those. So chances are it's tight kingpins or a rack and pinion that needs to be serviced. So usually you don't have to buy a new rack. You just open it up, get a YouTube video about it, push oil, oil into it. It's a fun, nasty job with a 90 weight gear oil splashing everywhere. You know, you'll have a great time doing it and it'll, it'll steer more easily for it afterwards. There's other stuff too. The tie rod ends can go bad. The inner tie rod ends can, can freeze up. But those are that's pretty bizarre stuff. So, if you've got great big tires, 
you know, like great big monster, you know, 215 tires on the front of the car. Yeah, you're going to need Hercules inside there to, to, to turn the wheel. Although, when you're going down the road, it should snap right, right back again. Um, but the, um, the more caster you have, the more the car actually moves up and down as you turn the steering wheel. Turn the wheel and the car actually moves up and down as you go through through the center and that's that's the resistance to turn is lifting the car some people opt to buy the d um ca uh, caster they you buy the caster shims and then steering's easier but then the steering doesn't return to straight either so easily so the car is pretty well designed the, the way that it is i'm off off topic here so Diamonds on Wheels is on YouTube for free. I'm watching it on my other computer. So, okay. Um, Sandy and Jim say big thanks to Kodai for lowering the average age of the Zoom attendees. Yeah, hey, thanks, thanks. Nice to hear. Okay, here we got Jim Holmes from Cedar Rapids. Did you see the article in the recent MGB driver about the distributor with the additional advance for the supercharged MGB? And if so, What's that all about? That's probably Rob Medinsky's distributor from British Vacuum Unit in, uh, he's in Connecticut, is that right? New Hampshire, someplace, Upper New York State. Um, he's been, it, there's two distributor guys in the United States that do a great job. One's Jeff Schlemmer in Minneapolis, and the other one is Rob Medinsky at British Vacuum Unit. Um, uh, Schlemmer's outfit is, he's, his name is, uh, advanced distributors so um, both these guys do a real great job but rob has got has got some interesting stuff he's got a he's got a distributor that that's supposed to work better for the for the supercharger and he also is a firm believer in ported vacuum 1972 all the cars went to manifold vacuum because vacuum is the easiest way to control emissions so they went to they went to manifold vacuum and um, Rob is convinced the cars run better like they did in 1967. That's as powerfully as the MGB engine ran with a 40897 distributor in it. And that takes, that takes ported vacuum, not manifold vacuum. Problem is there's no tip on the, on the carburetor to pick up the ported vacuum. So he's made himself a jig. And if you send your, your carburetor, to him, he'll put it in his little jig and drill a hole and put a fitting in the top. And now you can run an old fashioned proper distributor. Remember when you're getting your distributors rebuilt to ask to get the distributor that makes your car run the best. If it's a 73, you can put a 73 distributor back into it, but remember that that's basically detuned so that it, it, it puts out a certain amount of pollutants at certain times. So um, the best distributor is the 40897. It was used from 63 through 67. Car runs the best with that one, absolutely. So anyway, um, that's what that supercharged MG is all about. If there's oil on the garage floor, how can I tell if it's coming from the gearbox or the oil pan? Okay, well, let's, let's talk some more about about oil leaks because we, we we've had some questions and of course it's the big joke but it's the truth so if you want to find an oil leak go to napa and they have an oil they have a dye that you can put in your oil it comes under a ball camp b-a-l-k-a-m-p part number i don't know what that that is you pour it into the into the valve cover and then you need a black light so you've either got to go rum rummage through the stuff that you kept over from the 70s or go find a black light someplace. Run the car for 10 miles, come back, look at it with a black light, and wherever that oil is coming out, it will fluoresce like an electric banana. There is no question where it's leaking from. All oil moves towards the back of the car because of the wind, and all oil moves down because of gravity. So any oil leak from the valve cover can appear to be a leak from the gearbox because that oil gets back and it, there's, you got that little drip hanging off, the, hanging off the, the, the drain plug and you go, oh geez, the drain plug on my gearbox is leaking. No, it's not, it's, that's from the valve cover. But you don't know where it's from until you put in that oil dye. If, 
if you have a pressure leak, those are dangerous leaks. That's like having, having a hole in, in an artery. I mean, eventually you're going to run out of oil. There's only so many drops of oil in the car. A lot of drops, but only so many. Um, and and um, if you have an oil pressure leak, on, like on a B, or, uh, B engine, A engine, over on the right-hand side where the oil filter is and the oil pressure hose and that kind of stuff, T-types, it's on the left-hand side. If you've got an oil pressure leak, it leaks under pressure. You got to have. You got to sort that out. That's just nuts. That's crazy. You're going to run out of oil. So then you've got you've got um, pressure leaks from the inside of the engine getting pressurized. And this can happen with T-types. Just talked to Jim Perel in California about that. He had a car that brand new engine and it just it was leaking everywhere. And so that we hazarded upon that as a possibility. I'm waiting to hear back from it if in fact that's the truth. But um, if the inside of the engine pressurizes, oil's gonna get blown out of anywhere. So the first step is to make sure that, that the emission control system, as slight or as great as it is, is open. Well, I got a TC, I don't have one. Yes, you do, you got an oil draft tube, okay? It has to, has to be open. So um, after that, then there's just the failure of, of seals. Seals go bad. I, I got in my MGA last week, I got it all done, got it down on the floor, started it up, checked the brakes before I started to move it right to the floor, back up on jack stands. And I, I'm thinking today, I'm driving, I got 100 miles on my MGA today, and I'm thinking, when was the last time I did that master cylinder? And it was at least, at least 15 years ago. So time flies, and seals go bad. Seals in master cylinders, seals in engines. So engine, engine oil seals go bad, they just do. And the MGB engine, um, the, 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 the GB engine and all the engines after that get a groove cut in the back of the crank from the, from the crank oil seal. And uh, that, that has to be repaired when you're, when you're putting another engine together with a speedy sleeve or your machine shop has to grind down the, the boss at the rear of the, of the crank. So there's there's all kinds of all kinds of leaks you can have up there, but if you take care of the positive crankcase ventilation system, make sure you don't have pressure leaks. Get that ball camp die. You can tell pretty easily where it's coming from. Gearbox oil leaks are frustrating because anything you have to do, you got to take the gearbox out of the car. And although some of the guys will tell you that they have successfully removed their MGB uh, for standard four synchro gear, gearbox from their MGB without taking the engine out. If you've never done it before, if you haven't done it at least a half a dozen times, you'll know not to do it. Again, you gotta take the engine out, just have to. So, so excuse me, getting to the gearbox is just a bugger. It's just horrible. Oil leaks and brakes. Excuse me, those are all pressure leaks. You don't want pressure leaks in your brakes. No, no, no. You can tell because the inside of the, of the, of the, of the um, uh, wheel gets, gets uh, brake fluid gets flung out on it. You see the, the uh, line sticking out on the, on the tires. You can tell, you can tell that. Differentials leak sometimes. And, and um, you know, on the Salisbury GT, GT diff, that's, those are, those are nice. You can just take the back cover off and put the cover back on. I mean, we've had them where the, the tubes, the, the pressed steel tubes have come loose from the, from the, uh, from the cast middle and, and they leak there. I mean, you, you do end up with bizarre stuff, but almost always it's just old seals and, uh, and lack of, lack of ventilation. If, if your rear axle, if that's plugged up, because that, that has a vent, your gearbox has a vent. If those don't vent, you're gonna push oil out once it, once it pressurizes because of the heat. Okay, let's see, I'm, uh, this is from uh, Crystal Johnson. I'm restoring my 71B, which sat for years, now getting it, um, uh, now got it running now with a rebuilt distributor, did a compression test, 122, 120, 120, 122. Your thought, my thoughts, my thoughts, that's, a, that's about as close as you can get. You're, you're after a maximum variation of 10%. So 
So 10% on 120 is 12 off. So, so that's, um, uh, my math goes from 108 to 120. So two pounds, that's great. It's great. But keep in mind too, that if an engine is sat still for a long time, that no matter how you end, the, end up with the engine sitting there, two valves are always open. When the engine comes to rest, two valves are always open and those valves rust. So if you take an engine which hasn't run in six months and it's been damp or 16 years and, and some of the valves may have rusted, the face of the valve may rust. And if you check the compression, the compression is going to be in the toilet. Don't take the head off yet. Start it up. Get it running. Let it run for 15 minutes. Then check the compression. But 120, 122, that's, that's fine. Um, seems low to me, but gauges aren't precise you hope they're accurate but they're not precise how hot was the engine when you're spinning it over and what speed was it when you're spinning it over what valve lash was it when you were spinning it over and what was the ambient temperature when you spun it over all those have to do with the raw number that you actually get whether you get you know a compression of 105 or 210 um, generally speaking the higher the compression a figure the higher the compression inside the car, but you can't work backwards from that and figure out what it is. At least I have never been able to. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So from Mel Goldberg, so you can unmute yourself, Mel, if you're there, an MGA clutch whirl noise when I'm stationary with the clutch depressed in neutral. Hi, John, I think I'm, I might have misspoke a little bit. Okay. Uh, just typed. Uh, actually, it's when uh, I'm, on, I'm in neutral and my clutch is completely undepressed. Good, there's, thank you. <laughs> gonna, there's, and, yeah, there's yeah. a little, my fingers were moving quite, not quite fast enough. So, gotcha, okay. First of all, it's a 1957 MGA and I'm located in Northern California, Sonoma County. And uh, I've driven this car for 40 years and it's pretty much been like this for the last 40 years. It doesn't really affect anything as far as the clutch or gear shift or anything. It's just kind of a nuisance, little tinging noise when, when I depress the clutch. So um, when you're sitting, first of all, clutch operation, there's only three times, two times your foot should be on the clutch. One is when you're taking off, and one is when you're changing gears. Start at neutral, idle at neutral, stop light, stop start, stop start traffic, stop signs, put it in neutral, let it freewheel. Your foot should never be on the clutch. Okay. So um, so when your foot is off the clutch, the, the first motion shaft is spinning. The that runs the lay gear on the inside of the gearbox. So that's swishing and all the speed gears are turning. So it's just sitting there idling. And if you've got a wooden gear shift knob, it'll trans transmit the noise a whole lot more than some of the original ones. Um, if you've got a, a, a big one and you get a swishing, this, is, this, um, this ends up being an issue with some MGB owners, the swishing that you get from, from the gearbox. So that, but that's just common. That's it. That's so just uh, the so knob. What that, that, so the, what ends up happening is that, okay, so... I, I I follow your you know where, when you're supposed to okay. keep your foot off the off right. the clutch. So uh, if it's completely off the clutch, it's making this funny little noise. And if I depress that clutch just a hair, like I'm gonna say maybe a half an inch, okay, then it then it stops. Okay, so we've got a throw up bearing, which can move, and we've got the thrust plate on the on the um, on the back of the pr pressure plate. So you press in, you, you press the, you know, you operate the whole clutch, let go, the pressure plate pushes the, the release bearing back, but it only pushes it back far enough so that it, it barely touches, barely touches. And sometimes, because of an angle that it picks up, it does touch. So once a revolution, and by you know 800 rpm you're 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 picking up a chirping or something like like that and so when you when you it's just because it's just touching and as soon as you press on the clutch just a l little bit you get full contact 
maybe let up on the clutch and now it's in a slightly different position and it doesn't chirp for a while. So it's of no consequence. Okay. It drives you crazy. It, it does. And the reason why I even brought it up was that I read somewhere that you could put a shim somewhere near the clutch slave cylinder and it will, I guess, move it just, just a hair away from it so that it doesn't do that. Okay. Well, Triumphs do that. They've got a, they've got a spring a great big spring and you have to constantly adjust this thing um, so that when, when it presses, it presses the, the thing forward and you let up off of the clutch, it pulls it back. But if you pull it back too far, then you, you, you've got one full push with the clutch pedal and it doesn't get to the pressure plate. And then you've got another one, it barely touches it. So it's designed, it works just like front disc brakes. You know, the, the, the vagaries of the, of the front brake rotor Push the push the pads back just far enough so they're not rubbing. That's it. But sometimes they rub. So I I don't I don't know I don't know what the deal is. I just you know I'm still learning. I, I had a guy call me the other day. His his MGB gearbox um, like a 68B fell out of fourth gear. Fell out of fourth. And we went through all the possibilities, and that wasn't it. And he says, well, I was on MG Enthusiast and and um, or um, MG Experience and. Someone said use the springs from a three synchro B in there and it'll make the shifting a lot tighter. And I, I was asking him to shim it up with, with washers, but he used a, a bigger spring and it was great. So, you know, there, there is, there's, there's a lot of information out there. There's a lot of good people out there with, with really good information about what to do. This one I haven't heard of. All right. Thanks, John. Okay, so here we've got Truman Auctions. Must be Mr. Truman. Uh, what do you recommend to wrap rubber fuel lines from the mechanical fuel pump on a 78B to prevent vapor lock? Okay, so it turns out, it turned, and that's from, uh, that's from uh, uh, El Monte, Ontario. Um, so, um, Marty, it turns out that the, the vapor lock is not between the pump and the carburetor. That's not where the problem is because once the gasoline gets there, that, that pump will pump fuel, it'll pump gas, it'll pump anything into the carburetor. The problem is it's on the suction side. It is truly vapor lock. And on a Mission 1500, you've got a steel line that comes out of the gas tank, goes into a rubber line, goes from over the, over the uh, um, rear axle kind of, then it goes into a steel line, then it goes up by the gearbox where there's another rubber line, and then, and then why would they do this? There's a steel line on top of the gearbox. The gearbox gets really hot and it'll boil the gasoline. So you gotta get between the tank and the pump and just wrap, put something bigger. Put, I, I don't go, go to, go to, um, uh, Canadian tire and buy a half inch heater hose or something and just and just run some of that through. I remember we at some at sometimes we I mean you take that line right off the top of the gearbox. We would take it off. You have to take it out of the car, take it off. But you disconnect the the um, the fuel line from that and then run run just a long rubber fuel line. Seems creepy, but you know what are you going to do? Um, and insulate that. Put that fuel line inside another fuel line. And then just hook it up with clamps and zip tie it to the underside, underside of the frame in about 20 spots, so it isn't going to drag and catch some part of a moose that you've just run over. So um, that's the, that's the deal between the tank and the pump. That's where you're getting the um, the vapor lock. So, Hi, uh, John. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and good evening. You're doing a great job here, and good Thanks. evening to everybody all across the country there. Um, from Almont, Ontario. Uh, I'm, I'm just west of Ottawa, if you can picture okay. that. Um, anyway, yeah, I, I did um, take that uh, st uh, metal fuel line off that you're talking about that goes over the, you know, behind the engine uh, from the fuel tank, and I re replaced it with a rubber line. Um, and the other thing I, I did, John, um, the other day was um, instead of using, we have ethanol, um, you know, 10 percent ethanol gas here, the 89, I'm using the high, high test premium. Um, and it seems that in combination with the, the heat in the engine uh, seems to have um, made a big difference. But, but the wrapping of the fuel line, um, like I say, I have a rubber line from, um, and I put a, a, a fuel filter in as well, John. Yes. Um, and um, and I, every time I run it, I feel everything, because the mechanical fuel pump's quite hot. 
um, and the uh, but the carver yeah so I, I like I think I'll get some something from Canadian Tire some wrapping to go over that rubber hose and um, just just get a bigger piece of hose just get two two eight foot long piece oh wait you're in Canada uh, let's see that's uh, two and a half meters yeah um, don't worry about the yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway just 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 get some five sixteenths fuel line and the same length of heater hose one one easy for me to say run one within the other okay. clamp it on either end zip, zip tie it I bet that takes care of it as well as avoiding alcohol in the gasoline Al yeah, alcohol yeah. gasoline boils at a much lower temperature the right. modern cars are fuel injected they just they account for it it's you know the government seems to think that that's a way to buy the farmers votes and make the world cleaner and I'm, it does buy the <laughs> farmers votes but um, it sure doesn't help us. No, but so we just have to figure a way around it. Right. Here, and I know in Canada too, you can go on puregas.org on your phone, on your computer, and find gasoline stations that sell non ethanol gasoline, but sometimes that's just a hassle. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, are other people down in the States having that problem with the vapor law, with midgets? That oh, yeah. Midgets? Sure. Yeah. I had, I had, um, I talked to a guy in Tampa a lot and he had an MGC and when he he when he uh, he was test driving it in the summer and when he came up to a stoplight it would kill just kill. he didn't have to turn it off and it would kill okay. and he couldn't get it restarted and he was so upset and and um, he took he took regular gasoline and high test gasoline and took a teaspoon of each and just poured it on the exhaust manifold once he got back to the shop and the real gasoline sat there for a while, but the ethanol gasoline boiled away. It, it, it just boiled away at, at, at uh, a much, much lower temperature. Yeah. And it was boiling, his gasoline was boiling in the float bowls, you know, and, and that's, I mean, a lot of us with our cars, when we turn the car off, um, you know, the temp gauge goes all the way around to 230 degrees, mm -hmm. older cars, where you can actually see it. Um, 240 de degrees that underbonnet temperature just skyrockets yeah. but once it comes back down then the car starts okay it's okay. just you know finding the tricks that you have to so some cars for whatever reason are more susceptible to it I don't mean TDs more than TFs I mean some individuals cars you know and there's all kinds of heat shields and baffles and all kinds of stuff you can buy um, but in your case just two eight foot pieces of hose and that all Ought, ought to do it shield one from the other that's okay. what i've done in the past okay all right great okay. Thanks a lot, Tom. hey good luck thank you um okay from tim bowman your thoughts on can and filters to re to replace the stock canisters tim do you have um if you're still online um do you have su carburetors Is tim there can you unmute yourself tim i don't see on my my thing, but I, I don't, maybe Tim's gone away. Um, anyway, um, k and filters breathe better. Yes, they do. Um, they are the, the trapezoidal ones, conical ones, excuse me, the conical ones on the 77, um, 75 through 80 MGBs with dual carb conversions are great. But remember that air does not like a 90 degree corner. It does not like a corner. It wants a radius. And on all of our SU carburetors from 1963 through 1974, there's a horn, whatever you want to call it, a, a stack, a, a velocity stack. It's either part of the carburetor, if you think of it like that, or part of the air cleaner. It's that aluminum disc that fits on the front. So what you should do is incorporate that into the or buy small little sub stacks and incorporate that. Those stub stacks are good for anywhere from two to four horsepower. How can that be? Little tiny, little tiny stub stacks. But my associate over in Holland, Michigan, Carl Heidemann, who's written heavily for Grassroots Motorsports, has done, I don't know, I, I can't say for sure, but I know it's around 1,400 pulls on a dynamometer with an MGB with every imaginable conceivable mix of products and design that you can come up with and and the proof is in the pudding obviously 
a big bore exhaust is a whole lot better than a little tiny exhaust. No difference, no difference. Not one horsepower difference, nothing. Stub stacks, little tiny radius, just a little tiny ra radius, what difference could, could that make? Up to four horsepower, go figure. 32 degrees before top dead center, Oh, so you, you know, so you can't do it. You, you don't have a dial back timing light. You, you know, it's like, hey, this is close enough. And you end up at 27, 27 uh, maximum advance, five horsepower at the rear wheels. So, you know, they're, they're, they're just these little things that make a difference. Anyway, k and L air filters, nothing wrong with the factory filters. k ns look cool. They're a hundred bucks a piece. I'd use the factory ones, but if you want to use them, by the stub stacks to go inside them so that they work even even better. And then and then do you have to change your carburetor needles? That's the question. And I know that's some people say yes, some people say no. Talk to Joe Curto, joecurto.com. Joe's happy to take your call uh, in in Queens, uh, College Point, Brooklyn. So um, anyway, here we got oh from uh, uh, again from Truman. Uh, John, uh, should you top up coolant by filling the reservoir tank or the plug at the top of the radiator first? Um, you should you should fill the engine first with coolant at the top of the thermostat housing. Then put about you know make sure that the overflow tank, the expansion tank, has got about half full. Then when you start the car up, the air that collects at the top will expand because the coolant's expanding. That'll go into the into the overflow tank, and then then when the car cools, it sucks from the overflow tank back into the engine. That's the way it's supposed to be. So, but I, I would I would fill fill that that up. So, um, what's the best way uh, to flush the radiator and the engine coolant through the block on a '78 midget? Well, there are how many hose clamps? 19. And then 19 hose clamps, it's a lot of hose clamps. There's a lot of plumbing on those things. Um, 19 or 23 or something rather. Um, you know, you use a garden hose and make sure you get your heater cleaned out. The, the heater or the block drain is um, it's about a one inch bolt on the right hand side of the engine. I think it's to the rear of the carburetor, I think. Um, so it's uh, you just, you, you do what you can. It, it, which can I don't have a magic, I don't have a, a magic way of doing it, but make sure that you clean out the um, the heater matrix first because oh my gosh that just loads up with silt. So in case you can't get the car hot enough. So yeah, good. Thank you, John. Yep, you're welcome. Um, Rich Caldwell from Texas would like to ask a question about clearances between the goalpost frame section in the heater deck on the body. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. You know, when you do it, I, I had I had a printed, I had one printed. The guy was doing an MGA in all these. I just remember that. I must have skipped over it. I didn't mean to. Whether you're doing an A or a B doesn't make any difference. Everything is controlled by the position of the door. This is when you're doing body work. Everything is controlled by the position of the door. Um, so you you if you take the door off, you make you drill it first, so you know that you drill the hinges, so you can get it right back in the same spot again. Um, and and um, you make the front fender fit the, the front of the door. You make the rear fender fit the rear of the door. You make the sill fit the bottom of the door. Um, and you try to get the gap consistent. If on if on one side it's one eighth and the other side it's a quarter, I, you know I, you know. You want to go crazy? You want to get a bead welder and weld, weld all that? But uh, you know, I mean, everyone's got their own tricks. But um, God, I'm back to Paul Dershow. He is the guy with all the jigs. Carl Heidemann from Holland did about 20 MGA bodies and built all these jigs, and then and then he fulfilled his fantasy of doing body work on MGAs and sold all those jigs to Paul Dershow. So Paul's got the measurements. I, I, I don't. I don't. Uh, let's see. Oh yeah, here we got Jim Perel. Don't forget Chevy Chase and Funny Farm, where they destroy a nice TF over a cliff 
into the water. Yeah, yeah, you just hope that they, that wasn't really true. Um, but I don't know how it couldn't be. So here we've got, um, what's the best place to get a replacement three-point retractable seat belts um, in uh, Moss, Moss. And remember that Moss doesn't sell just in the United States. There's Moss Europe. And it comes, if you're in, and this is from Marty from Canada. So um, that stuff comes just as fast into Canada as it comes from the United States into Canada. You can order from Moss Europe. You can order from the Ritter Brothers. Um, you can order from the MG Owners Club in England. You can order from Brown and Gammons. There's another great big firm uh, somewhere it used to be, um, I'm just blank, uh, somewhere around Brussels, Anglo parts uh, around Brussels. So there's a lot of places that you can get seat belts, but Moss is just, that's, that's fine. Or Roadster Factory, or Victoria British, sure. In, in, in any of those guys. So. Thanks a lot, John. Oh, and here, here, we've got, here we've got the, the, the UV die. Um, we've got a part number, 765-2661. It's over on the chat section. So if, if any of you want to take the, um, uh, go down to Napa, and it's the 765-2661 ultraviolet die. It re is just wonderful. It's just great. I mean, it's just instant. You can tell where it's leaking. There's no question. It's nice. Okay, so here we got Corey. Why would a 74 rubber bumper um, MGB with HS4 carbs run better with vacuum advanced removed or block as opposed to connected, which mine appears to do? Because you don't need the vacuum advance. Okay, first of all, you don't need the vacuum advance. T types didn't have it, um, the 69 Sprite didn't have it, race cars don't have it. Uh, vacuum Advance is designed for drivability and mileage. So um, you don't need it. But what you do need is the correct advanced spec for your engine. And so is this hooked up to vacuum? You know, is it, what's, the, what's the timing? It should be 32 before at full mechanical advance. But if it's the original distributor, um, then it's going to run better with a, if you put it back to the ported. Uh, if you wanted to run it, uh, as well as the engine will run, you've got to you've got to get the carburetor drilled and go back to an early distributor. But something screwed up there. You can call me tomorrow. We we can talk through it, and um, I'd be happy to happy to tell you. So here's uh, um, uh, when winterizing a '78 midget or any MG, is it a good idea to run the engine once a month to get things moving? It's, it would seem so. It would seem so. Sure, limber the thing up. Problem is. You don't get the exhaust hot enough, so you get all that water vapor in the exhaust, and the exhaust rusts out. So no, it's not a good idea. Um, on my website, I, I have to make an unabashed pitch for, for my PayPal button on my website, please. Um, if you go to my website, universitymotorsltd.com, and go up in the upper right-hand corner, uh, there's a PayPal button that says, help John afford his, his retirement, but, but, um, you can go on there for free too, and you can go and get winter storage instructions. And there is everything in there, every combination of things that you might do, bagging up naphthalene mothballs or putting jack stands in the center of, of pizza pans with dirty motor oil in them or uh, taking the seats out. I, there's there's a hundred, hundred owners have tried a hundred things, but running the car isn't a good idea. You go out and run it around the block. Oh yeah, sure, sure. Get get it out, go out and drive it. Sure, that's that's just fine. Get it real hot, but you can't just run it in the garage and, and hope that that's going to get rid of the, the um, vapor. So, okay, so here we got a seventy two B. I can't get my flash to pass to work. I did buy a new turn signal switch, and all the purple wires are hooked up. So Dennis, your um, your bright light flasher. That's a, that's a purple a purple wire into the switch. Um, and then it combines with the blue with white, which is common with the high beam switch. So only on flash to pass, only when you pull the switch towards you, should you get purple up there. And the only way to tell what's going on is to take a 12 volt test light, not a meter, 12 volt test light, a cheap one. Napa, 
seven dollar one with it looks like an alley you know an ice pick with an alligator clip on the end of it and go into the switch and actually test the connection that that is made when you engage flash to pass and see um, you can see which one is the blue with white because you can turn on your bright light you can turn on your headlights and then and then click that to bright lights and you can see which tab is is blue with white or is bright and then the the one the one that the other one of the switch should be hot a lot of those switches come from the same country that um, <laughs> our most recent medical challenges come from and some of them aren't made as well as the original switches so it, just because you've got a new switch or even a second new switch doesn't mean that it's correct um, but it usually means that you can fix it you know send it back but what a hassle just fix it so call me tomorrow i, get, I can take it just a little bit farther on that um, we got the uv die um, non-running non-running 77b troubleshooting no spark to plugs Okay, so either you've got power at the coil or not. You got power at the coil all the time or just a startup. And either you're making or breaking on the other side of the coil. Um, you know, you've got to have the points opening and closing or and if it's electronic ignition, that's got to make, make or break. So um, it's an old crane. Those usually are just fine. Um, but you can take the wire from the center of the cap and pull the wire off and put that over to your you know, coil or the dipstick or something or other. Have your associates spin the engine over in neutral. And you should get a nice crisp blue spark about that long. I mean, monster spark, inch long, inch long spark. And that goes into the distributor cap where if the rotor is faulty, it'll bleed the, bleed the power off and it won't get into the cap. So there's lots and lots of steps in there, but um, I wouldn't start buying parts until you get it diagnosed. Again, you can call me, we can go back through the, the diagnosis, um, but you just go connection to connection until you back it up until you find it. So what would cause, here we got uh, Arnold, E. Ruth Arnold. What would cause the engine of my 75, 74 and a half BGT to occasionally shudder shutter in first gear i've heard it could be oil that gets on the clutch it could be it could be it's really odd to have that t-type shutter real badly uh a shutter it's odd to have an M mgb in the, the shutter i mean the whole car is just shaking just shaking yeah, yeah and it doesn't happen it, any other it, time she's been doing it for years off and on and it it she'll do it two or three times in a week and then not for months or a year. And she's probably been doing it for the last, at least the last 10 years. Well, if you want to spend 2,500 bucks and get a new clutch, you can find out if it's that. <laughs> or, I think that's, the only thing, that's the only thing, I don't know how much a clutch is now, I don't run the shop anymore, but yeah. it's, they used to be, it used to be, I'm so used to it. Oh, you know, I just kind of, you know, ease off the gas and then proceed and she stops. Sure. Sure, sure, that's it. Sometimes um, it's not it's not good to slip the clutch, you know. But you can if there's an if there's um, stuff on the clutch, you, you can burn it away. But then you're going to burn the clutch up too. So what's the point? Yeah, the the factory workshop <laughs> manual I think gives four point three five hours for getting the engine out of the car, getting a new clutch on, and getting it back yeah. in. Okay, but today, I mean, you're fighting I'm all. I'm not even sure that maybe, I can't remember, to be honest, that I may even have had a new clutch in between all this time. I mean, I can't remember the last time I had a new clutch, but it's been do she's been doing it for so long, it, I could even have had a new clutch. I don't know, but I just, you know, I'm, I'm, I feel comfortable that you don't say, oh, my God. You know? No, no, it's, it's uh, no, no, it's, that's, it's cheaper, cheaper just to, to suffer it. Live with it, yep. yeah. Blame, okay. blame, your friend who's, blame your friend who's who's in the car. What shutter? Yeah. You know? <laughs> Joan, that's what you always say. Yeah, yeah. Oh, let's Thanks, see, Ray. let's see. Kodai here. He's got my friend, uh, my friend with my friend Connor with him, wanted to know should uh, he switch to a dual circuit master cylinder 
or keep the original reservoir. Oh, you know, switching over to dual brakes, dual circuit brakes on an earlier midget is a real problem. You know, single circuit brakes are just fine. You just have to be more aware, more aware that there can be a problem. How often is it that you <coughs> jump on the brakes in an emergency stop and one of the brake lines actually blows out right there? Hardly, hardly ever, hardly ever. You almost always get some sort of warning, like my brakes don't feel good. Well, then you should fix your brakes, right? But starting in 1968, when the government decided that, that, that they, you know, they just wanted to, to make sure we were safer, and not everybody understood, you know, all the, all the ins and outs of mechanics, they put in the dual circuit brakes. And if your front brakes go out, you still can't stop the car very well, but you got something, you, you got something. So I, I wouldn't do that, I, I'd keep the okay. Can I uh, ask one question really quickly? Yes. So um, I'm currently replacing the outer sills on my 75 midget. Okay. Do I tack in the end caps first or should I weld in the sills first? Weld in the sills first. Mm -hmm. Okay. And remember that everything is predicated by the fit of the door, mm -hmm. that you should drill out all the old rivets with a, with a um, um, spot weld drill, that you need 200 pairs of vice grips to hold, maybe not quite yeah. any, but a whole lot of them to hold it in place. And mm -hmm. then the, the trick is when you're welding, you know, because you can't spot weld when you're at home, um, so you got a piece of metal which is relatively flat, and you've got another piece of metal you're going to bring up to it. Put, like a hole, well. put a hole through this piece of metal, a quarter inch hole, five sixteenths hole, drill a hole through it all the way along. And then when you put it up against it, weld weld a rosette weld in, into each of those holes. Okay. And, and just just be careful as you go. Uh, welding is like any other skill. There's some real basic rules, and then it's experience. So mm -hmm. I've I, already, I, I'm down I've, to um, nine o'clock, and I, I know that I've got 41 new messages on the chat. This is just awful, and I I just I can't I can't get to them. Um, but um, but I will tell you that my next one, and I will allow more than 100 people. I don't know what's happened here. My my fault. Um, my next meeting is 623 Tuesday, 7 o'clock Eastern, same time as here. And um, I mean, same time as the one tonight. And um, I, will, I, will, I will be happy to um, entertain your questions anytime throughout the day. You can call me anytime. I'm retired. Every day is a Saturday. Um, so um, I have, I do believe I've been recording this. Yes, I am recording this. If you want to watch it again, if you can possibly stand to watch it again, it'll be on YouTube shortly. Um, go, go to that PayPal button and, and, and help me out. And until then, you know, the brakes are the most important part of the car. You know, the brakes, the steering and the brake lights. After that, worry about how it runs. After that, worry about the kind of radio you've got. So brakes, steering and brake lights safety fast. So call me anytime, email me. If you got to have an answer, call me because my emails stack up. If you've emailed me, you know that. So anyway, thank you very much. It's a pleasure for everybody. Good night. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. Again, John. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. I've got everyone on so, Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Hey, thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Tony, see you later. See you later. Thank John. you. Thank John. you. Good night, John. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good morning. Good morning. Good yeah, okay. Good afternoon. <laughs> Depends where you're watching from, I guess. <laughs> okay. okay. Bye, John. All right. John Leone, you got a, who's Frank Leone? He used to collect two cent pieces in uh, Manhattan. So anyway, good night all. Good night.